Welcome everyone. Uh, good to see your faces. Um, hopefully the sky is as blue for you as it is in my digital background here. Um, my name is Pete Huff. I'm part of the Wallace Center. I'm joined with uh, by several other members of the Wallace Center to bring this call uh, with you all today, uh, including Andrew, who's also going to be doing some speaking um, and introducing some of our presenters, um, who we'll get to here in a, in a moment. Um, but I just want to welcome you to this call we're pulling together um, that's focused on using maps for food systems access and planning. Uh, this came out of uh, some threads that were bouncing around on the FSLN uh, COVID response listserv, and so we saw that this could be a good opportunity for us to connect with folks and um, hear some good perspectives and some experience uh, from different members of that network and also have a conversation to chat with folks about how mapping and using mapping can help to connect people in person and help to move information around efficiently. So we're going to focus on um, two presentations today, uh, but overall we're looking at how we can use mapping technology to move information um, and help with immediate food access and availability uh, concerns that are coming up in COVID uh, times, but also how can we think a little bit longer term with mapping and um, how systems might need to change and how the nouns and the verbs on the map, as one of our presenters put it, um, can shift and maybe work together more effectively and create more equity and access across all the food systems. Um, so we're going to be looking at kind of the, the relationships as well as the endpoints, starting points and endpoints, uh, and our presenters will talk a little bit more about their experience in particular geographies. Um, and as I mentioned, the end goal is how do we make sure that we get more people connected to good food and to each other in that process. So we'll focus on how to create equity, empowerment to lift up uh, good work and good communities along the way. Just really quickly, as far as the Zoom stuff goes, the housekeeping, um, just like I mentioned, you are on mute. Uh, we are recording, um, but we will um, have some times for interaction. We'd ask in the chat to go ahead and um, uh, you can uh, access a couple things there. One is a place where you can sign up for some breakout rooms a little bit later. We are going to break out based on the two presentations. Uh, what we're asking is you tell us which breakout room you want to go to and we'll automatically kind of route you into that. So there's a link to a Google Doc there where you can put your name uh, and your preference as far as breakout rooms. So that's an important thing to do before the end of our pre last presentation so that you can go right into your breakout room. Um, so that's in the chat box. You can access that Google link there. Um, there's also, uh, it's a place where you can put any technical questions if you're having any issues. I can't, I can't do this, I can't hear that. Um, the Wallace team is there to help on the back end. Um, and also it's a great place to share your name, your organization, where you're tuning in from so that we all can maybe find some folks uh, that we've never met before, even digitally uh, through Zoom. Um, and finally, we also are going to um, use that document to share some information about other mapping efforts that are out there. So part of our uh, Google Doc that we'll share is also a place where you can share some maps that you're working on or that you've seen emerge or that you're planning on working on um, so that we all can see different mapping efforts and how that's being done in different and innovative ways around the country. So uh, that chat box is going to be full of opportunity, full of information. It's also going to be pretty busy. So we'll try to um, uh, direct you there when we need you to sign up for the breakout rooms first and foremost. So as far as the flow goes, um, we'll do pr two presentations, a couple introductions, uh, some short presentations by some folks that are working in this space, um, and, uh, and then we'll also then break out into some separate conversations in breakout rooms with those presenters so folks can ask those questions. So we're going to kind of hold questions. We'll have a few immediate questions right after the presentations, but try to hold those for the breakout session if you can. Um, we will ask a few before breakout um, just to kind of get the whole process moving. Um, you can use the chat box to share your questions. Um, so with that, I think we've covered all the nuts and bolts. Um, I'll pass it off to Andrew from the Wallace Center who can uh, do some introductions for our first presenters. All right, thanks, Pete. Um, all right, we'll work on that for this their breakout sheet um, once we get to the next presentation. Sorry about that. But um, yeah, so we wanted to start with an example of a statewide map that's focused on food access. And Sarah O'Burl and Brooke Kelleher offered to share um, their, their work. They've worked with the team at University of New Hampshire to develop a map um, in response to COVID that they've shared. And um, yeah, so I'll just turn it over to you all to share how that was developed and how it's been used since. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Oberly. I work for UNH Cooperative Extension, and 
typically we do direct ed teaching. So this is a little different for us and actually our first time really using maps. This is very new. So this is completely in response to COVID-19. And how it really came to be was Brooke and I were on a meeting after this kind of just mid-March, you know, everyone's staying at home um, and a bunch of organizations, food pantries, food access people in the area got together and had a call and trying to gather resources. And we realized that none of these agencies or organizations were even connecting themselves. No one knew what the other ones were doing. And then also there's, there were all these new efforts, initiatives, these grassroots kind of pop-up pantries that were coming up that never existed before COVID-19. And we kind of thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if there was a way to display all this? It kind of happened in real time. Um, we have access to food pantry information about when they're open, when they're closed. But as we know, a lot of the food access landscape has really changed since COVID-19. Um, delivery, pickup, times, you know, whether, you know, commodity foods is changing, we really wanted to capture all that. So this is kind of how the map came to be. Um, so I'll just add in, if we can share it at some point, we'll be able to. Um, yes. So we really worked with, since we didn't really have any, any experience, Brooke, I know, kind of took a class on this before. So she was like, oh my God, this would be like so awesome if we could map all this stuff. Um, and we have a kind of map expert at Cooperative Extension who works in our community and economic development department. And he even sent out an email and was like, who wants to work on this? So he really was the one who kind of went behind the scenes and really formulated the map. But the way we populated it and each site on the map is a little bit different. So instead of taking existing data that was kind of already out there, what we did instead was we created a survey or a form that these sites then would fill out themselves. So the survey and form would capture information, you know, basic information like location, um, hours of operation, but then they also would capture, oh, thank you, Brooke. Um, it captured information like, are you accepting donations? We found out a lot of pantries weren't accepting them at the time we wanted to collect this. Uh, but we also found out there's all these efforts like senior housing sites and just regular public housing sites were like, oh, we'll take prepared food, we'll take donations, we'll really take whatever. And the idea too, it's not just in the end getting the people the food, but also creating kind of this system and network of food access in New Hampshire. So connecting restaurants, grocery stores, um, food distributors. So we had a big one in Boston that is based in New Hampshire and they had a ton of extra food. So really kind of connecting all those resources together. So it's not just for a person who's trying to find food, but also for businesses or people who are looking to donate as well. So that is kind of the form we sent out. And I have to say it was really in part to, um, we started with the New Hampshire Public Health Association. So we relied on a lot of our partners in the state to kind of get the word out about this as well. Um, you know, we would just have anyone from like Chamber of Commerce to, you know, Department of Ed and all these places would kind of share this to help get the word out and populate the map. So that's kind of how that came to start out. Um, I'm just gonna make sure I'm not forgetting anything. And then, yeah. yes, please Brooke, jump in. Yeah, so I will just say, so I don't know if other people have experience with mapping, but kind of like Sarah touched on, um, we do have a, sort of geospatial person who specializes in this that normally teaches this programming to others. Um, but he really stepped up and said, well, in this situation, I can be kind of that creator. So we, we were really, really fortunate with that. Um, I will share the map as well. So we can, I know we, we definitely wanna have a lot of discussion, so we won't take too much time. Um, and this is really a community needs map. So instead of us kind of sitting around and being like, oh, like what can we do to help? We relied on our partners to be like, what are you hearing on the ground from people? Like what do people need? Um, so this is like a real time map where someone can go and look on their phone and they can see where they can find food. We have all these sites finding food. You can, you know, non-prepared food, prepared food. We've noticed an increase of people wanting prepared food or delivery. Um, you know, the older population, senior population are advised not to leave. So we've had a big request for that. Find personal items as well, um, as well as donating and volunteering. So 
This is also an evolving kind of living thing as well. So we're gonna be adding to this map as well based on what the community is telling us. So we also are gonna soon be adding a food benefits tab where people can find local offices that help with um, getting benefits such as WIC, SNAP, commodity foods, those types of things. Also just programs, incentive programs throughout the state. So we have some, if you like swipe your EBT card, you get 50% off fruits and vegetables. We also notice that a lot of farms have been creating more farm stands since farmers markets are canceled. And there's been an initiative to try to get them to use, um, or I guess have SNAP and EBT machines. So we've noticed an increase in that. So we're gonna be adding that as well. And then also even a something we're partnering with the Department of Ed, we're gonna be adding summer meal sites as well to here because you know, we're hearing that's a need. Yeah. Um, another big thing that we wanted to touch on is how this map is now being used. So um, I think like it's, it's very natural. We wanna get this out to consumers, to people who are in need of food and food access sites. One of our kind of like we mentioned with sending out information at the beginning to gather what would be populating the map. The same thing is happening now with how we are, um, with who is using this map. It's not just individuals needing food. We really, really um, worked with those partners, such as caseworkers, social workers, um, healthcare providers who are using this map for the people that they, they work for, even property managers who, um, who have low income um, rentals that they do. So it's been very interesting just creating connections with all of these people that we can then bring into our other work. Yeah, initially when we created this, it was like, okay, it's for like the consumer essentially who's gonna be using it. And then we found out, you know, welfare offices are using this, caseworkers. It's just been like a variety of people are using this that we kind of didn't intentionally think about, but we're so happy that they're using it the way they are. Um, so that's kind of been something great that's happened as well. And then just like the last thing before we wrap this up, um, a lot of the things that we've learned out of this include um, from Shane, the who we've worked with so much on this map, is that not everything needs to be turned into a map. Um, and it's not just a place where you're putting all of this information and it looks nice, but it's more than that. It's how it's interactive and how users use it. So the function of things instead of us, and we've tried to be very, very thoughtful and take our time in creating this resource. Um, so not just saying like have what what are what is the user looking for if somebody are they looking for um like these maybe these titles that we call things sorry i'm not being very clear about that but um or are they looking for the function like are they looking for a type of site that offers a specific type of thing so kind of use like thinking from a user and how it can be interactive um, and then the very cool behind the scenes thing is so we had those surveys and then to keep this updated, we also have um, a team that can go through and look at all of the submissions using this manage dashboard. So they can go through, they can see when things were submitted, the date last updated, we can resubmit the survey information as we get updates. So this is just some behind the scenes things that we've been able to use. We can also separate it by county, see different trends throughout some of the stuff. So that's more helpful for us on um, maybe not the public interface, but for us to use in our programming in the future. So we've just learned a lot of things about this. We're really looking forward to hearing about um, what other people are doing as well and how we can all complement each other. And I'll just add, I noticed one of the questions was upkeep because obviously everything's changing as this pandemic evolves. Um, we so we help we put together kind of a core team that's helping with editing, but we're also really asking for each site because they know what they're doing. We have a separate form so they can submit any updates. So they just, you know, we have all their emails or contact information. We send them kind of like maybe monthly like reminders, like if you have information, just update it like this. Um, and also too, our team will also 
kind of check and we ask them to be aware and look at social media and Facebook because this is where a lot of these like grassroots efforts and even just food pantries will post changes on Facebook and kind of just being aware about things like that. So that's how we've been updating it. I don't know. Um, so this is the site. So we have somewhere in um, at the end of the map where it says if you want to submit a new site or update a current site, if you click that update a current site, that brings you to that second survey that I showed where you can update your listing. And then as they update that, it comes into that dashboard that I showed. Um, this one. So it will come in, that second survey will come in and that team Sarah is talking about will see um, the updates that have been sent in by anybody and then we'll be able to update it in the back end so um and and this took a lot more time than us just putting all the information out there and not thinking about how we would keep it updated but for the long run and beyond covid 19 response it will definitely help us and i'm just seeing some questions in the chat and obviously andrew and pete like cut us off whenever um yeah, i think um Unless if it's a quick one, but we can save those for the breakout rooms as well. Yeah, okay, let's save them for the breakout room. Perfect, yep. Yeah, some of those I think would be good to dive into. Um, yep. awesome. But yeah, thank you for sharing the, the back end of that and how you got it created. I think it's great um, to see all that. If And on the, um, the sign-up sheet, that looks like there's an issue. So if you've already put your name in, if you could close that, um, I guess the Google Google is overloaded. So um, if you could just continue, or just close out if you've already done it, if you haven't. Um, Click that link in the chat to get signed up. Great. And back to you, Pete. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So yeah, just another reminder, we will kind of move into breakouts here, uh, and that'll be a great time to dive into some of the specific questions that you might have um, for Sarah Brooke or for our next um, speaker, um, Michelle Miller. So uh, before I introduce Michelle and let her take the floor, just again, a reminder to just click into that Google Doc and um, add your name and your preference for the breakout room so that we can start sorting you on the back end and then you'll get automatically routed to your, uh, your breakout session. You can also still put questions in the chat as well. Uh, and we'll try to just catch those and um, try to make sure we get them answered if we can. Um, but we're going to transition now for a quick uh, presentation uh, on another perspective on this from Michelle Miller. Um, Michelle is um, uh, joining us from the University of Wisconsin and their Center for Integrated Agricultural Systems, where she's the Associate Director of Programs, um, asked Michelle to come on and speak a little bit more about um, some of her research and uh, values-based uh, food chains, food supply chains, um, and specifically looking at what's happening within those different segments of supply chains right now for different scales, different products, different end users, how that's uh, pre-existing patterns with COVID, uh, before COVID, and now what's shifting and what's changing. Um, the lines that are connecting the dots that are on maps, like the ones that were shared by Sher uh, Sarah and Brooke, are changing. And so uh, Michelle is a great person to give us some perspective on those shifts. So Michelle, I'll pass it over to you and you can take it away. Okay, sorry about that. Um, thanks, Pete, and uh, thanks, Sarah and Brooke. Really interesting work, really great um, response, quick response to a, real, a serious need. Um, uh, I wanted to share with you a little bit about um, kind of the bigger picture. So you guys have been working on the very small picture and I'm gonna bring it way out. So be ready for that. Um, so really what we're looking at at the national level is we've got three primary food flows. We've got food service, we've got a retail, and we've got emergency food. And emergency food is really meant to kind of kick in when the other things aren't working. Um, but what's happened in a lot of cases is that the emergency food is, is ongoing now. And I think um, Brooke and Sarah, you've seen that, that there were probably a lot of pantries and things were ready um, to expand very quickly but the vulnerable population has increased so much because of people out of work and, um, and people ill. Um, so um, I wanted to mention too that um, up until 2010, we ate more at home than we did away from home. And that that's part of the disruption that we've been seeing that um, as the restaurants and um, institutions closed, then suddenly we had um, uh, difficulty moving that food from one flow into the retail sector. And so that, that disruption is something um, would have been hard to predict that we would suddenly close everything, but obviously that's what happened. 
Um, there are also two kinds of food that we're looking at. Um, we've got shelf stable food. Um, usually this is processed. Um, and then there's perishable food, um, which requires refrigeration. And frozen food, um, oddly, is kind of in between the two because as long as you've got frozen capabilities, you can keep that food for quite a long time. Whereas for refrigerated perishable food, it, it goes bad within weeks. Um, then we've got um, two kinds of buyers, and really this is about ownership of the supply chain, really. We've got vertically integrated companies um, um, that own uh, a lot, a big portion of the supply chain versus independents, where we've got multiple businesses working together to get food from a farm to a retail outlet or an institution. Um, if you haven't seen Phil Howard's book on concentration and power in the food system, I highly recommend that as a great place to look at how vertical integration is causing um, problems in the supply chain. Really, this has been a disruption that's been in place for probably since the 70s. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it's been a slow moving disruption as opposed to COVID that's been very fast. Um, you can also look to Progressive Grocer for information on um, what the biggest grocers are um, around the country. Um, you can get some in, um, inform you'll have a better sense than in your own community where the independents are, what, in what groceries are independents and which, which are subsidiaries of Kroger, for instance. Um, let's see. So I want to talk about a couple of maps. Oops. I have to do this. Okay. So this first map um, is actually where people work in different parts of the agriculture supply chain. And you can see um, for fruit and tree nuts um, that a lot of the concentration of product is coming from the West Coast. So that means that it's flowing from the West to the East to fill big urban markets um, throughout the United States. Um, if you look at uh, closely at some of the boxes, you can see some green elsewhere in the map, however. So you can see that there's some tree fruit grown on the East Coast. There's kind of a lot in Florida, relatively speaking. There's a little bit in Texas, um, some in Wisconsin, Michigan. So we've got opportunities to um, improve our regional uh, food production by focusing on these little, these little nuggets of areas where we've already got um, some product. Um, this is a really helpful map to understand kind of where we're going. So there are, uh, what the expectation is, is that over the next 20, 30 years, we'll be moving into these general areas around the United States. So urban concentration will increase. Um, in 11 areas. And if you think about where the food was being produced and where it's going to be eaten, it looks like a lot of food is going to have to be moving eastward. Um, and or um, other regions could start growing more of their own food. Um, early on in our um, research, we started looking at what does the supply chain actually look like? And we, we thought it was helpful to break it down a little bit. So you've got a farmer, they move their product to a packer or a processor. Then they hire a carrier or a distributor, and that distributor takes it to a distribution center. And then from there, smaller um, vehicles can move to retail outlets. And um, if you think about, again, the vertical integration of the supply chain, if you've got a company like Kroger or Costco, you know, Costco now has their own chicken um, 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 production facility in Nebraska. They take it to the processor that's owned by Costco. They take, they take the trucks to move it to their distribution centers and to the retail outlets. The terminal markets on the map are the ones that are um, uh, multi-tenant, we call that, uh, where multiple independent businesses can sell their product to retail outlets or into cities. Um, it's helpful to know where the independent grocers are, and this, um, these maps are available um, through the um, National Grocers Association. Um, you can find out in your area how many independent grocers there are. So if you know that um, you've got independent grocers that are not getting product, um, that they might be able to take some local product if, if you know farmers that have it available. So one of the things we've been trying to do is get really good data on how food is moving um, 
um, throughout the United States. And right now, this is the best we've got. And um, you can see that there are some really big food movements in certain parts of the country. And there are other parts of the country that don't have a lot of food moving through them or to them. And um, the problem is that most of the, uh, the, we think the modeling is sound on, on these programs, but the problem has been the data. So this particular map would include um, movements of corn and soybeans for ethanol production, which is what I think the movement from Iowa to uh, mid-state Minnesota is about. Um, uh, it also includes movement of other non-food items um, like animal feed. And so it's not really very helpful from that point of view. So one of the research projects we're working on right now is to try to improve this model so we have a much better idea of where food is moving. Another way to figure out where food is moving is by looking at the USDA's um, uh, transportation da dashboard site. Um, in it, uh, we know that most food is moved by truck. So in it, we can look at um, how, what, uh, where, where food is coming from. So right now, um, this is from, I think, mo this covers most of March. So we can see that um, Mexico is the primary um, mover of um, the top 20 commodities. Um, and then it goes down, the list goes down. And then these, when, uh, when you're on the live site, you can see that, you know, we've got a lot of dry onions coming from Mexico, tomatoes, avocados, cucumbers, tomatoes, blah, 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 on it goes. And then you can switch the graph so that it shows where things are coming from, from whether Central California or Southern California or Colorado, and how it's, um, um, and what product those individual locations are bringing. This could be really helpful if we know, for instance, that, um, the H-2A workers are not um, at, uh, allowed into the country and um, there are labor shortages in planting and harvesting. Or for instance, if there's a serious drought, again, in Arizona or California, we can start to identify what commodities might be in low supply and how regional uh, growers might be able to fill in those gaps. Here's another example of a graph. This one is uh, from 2018 to 2020, um, looking at um, lettuce, um, green leaf lettuce in the San Joaquin Valley. And we can see how, how um, in this April, there, uh, uh, there was a lot more product coming from the San Joaquin Valley um, to this April. Those are approximately the same dates. This is the other April date. So we can see that um, in 2018, there was a lot of product, uh, a little bit less in 2019, and we're on um, in route to have even less product in 2020. Um, I wanted to bring up um, some of the work that's been going, in Europe, uh, going on in Europe around um, um, three-party logistics um, efforts to improve transportation efficiencies and make it possible to move food in a more cost-effective way. And this has been really helpful um, for the food banks in Wisconsin. I know they've been looking um, really closely at how to improve their efficiencies and movements. Um, the um, coolest thing that they've got is that if in that first mile of moving product from um, farm to a processor, if you share a common vehicle, you can save um, quite a bit of, uh, of um, um, you know, can realize a lot of efficiencies. So you can increase vehicle loading factor by 11%. You can increase um, sector served by the um, uh, vehicle by 8%. Um, if you look at um, the UCC is also a food terminal, a public food terminal. And so if you've got one of those multi-tenant uh, um, food terminals for independent businesses, you can see a 7% reduction in CO2 emissions, um, a 10% reduction in vehicles used. That's a really important measure for um, congestion in a city and being able to deliver food into a city. I think that's all I've got. Yep, that's all I've got. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Really appreciate that. Um, and we're going to have more time to dig into these, um, uh, what Michelle just covered, uh, as well as uh, what was covered by the previous presenters um, by moving into our breakout sessions, which is what we're going to do now. So um, go ahead and open that uh, document that's linked in the chat box and be able to and add yourself into one of two rooms. Uh, one will have uh, Sarah and Brooke in there to 
answer some more questions about how they went about the New Hampshire mapping process. And then Michelle will be in the other room to talk a little bit more about some of these larger systems mapping and flows that she was just reviewing. So we can dig into a little bit more of the details. We captured some questions uh, in this chat box in this big session, and then we'll come back here directly to um, uh, to hear back, report back from folks of what was discussed and see if there's any kind of key takeaways that we'd like to uh, share with folks. Also, while we're, you know, routing folks into the breakout room, the same Google Doc where you sign up for the breakout room is also got a separate tab at the bottom where you can list some of the maps that maybe you rely on or that you're aware of or that you see emerging because we also would like to produce that out of this call is to be able to share a resource with folks um, to uh, be able to reference and you know essentially aggregate some back best practice uh, folks have spent a lot of time in inventing wheels in this regard and so we should all uh, take advantage of of that by not having to reinvent them for ourselves and our own purposes uh, a lot of great approaches and different uh, innovations um, Andrew are we ready to launch the breakouts um, not quite might, you might want to take a few questions I need a little time to get the get those sure. loaded up yeah so we'll do we got a couple questions here um, Maybe we'll, uh, for Sarah and Brooke, there was a question that came right out of the gate around if there's been any conversations about partnering across extension to do what you all have done in New Hampshire um, and share your format, uh, kind of the back end coding and the process um, that was used. Um, yeah, so we actually, we had, there was an extension office through um, Pennsylvania. So it was actually the governor who saw this sort of initiative and reached out to um, some of the state partners there and including Extension. Um, and Shane Bratt, who we mentioned earlier, so he's, he really specializes in this like geospatial and mapping um, that we worked with on this. He is, he, that is something that he's thinking really critically about, about how do we make this something that's easy for other states to replicate. Um, we might, well, I'm sure that we will notice ways that we could have done this better as we go on and especially as we connect with other states that have done similar initiatives, but very differently. Um, and hopefully that's something that we can learn from each other and think about what is the best way moving forward for other states to do this, whether it's through extension or through other state partners. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Thank you, Rick. Another question came in uh, was for you, Michelle. Um, you, you mentioned some key resources, um, websites where folks could go to pull up information like the commodities by volume chart. Um, and folks were just curious if you could kind of give, you know, maybe your, your, your top three, top five uh, places um, that you are pulling some of this information from so that they can go and um, do that for their own particular areas. So first of all, um, if you're on the um, Food System Leadership Network list, I've posted that in the, I think, which um, there's a stream that's talking about mapping and um, keeping track of all the stuff. I posted that all of these are in that list. So that's probably your best bet. Great. And we can re-forward that as well. Um, grab that from the list and just circulate that back out to folks so um, you can have easy access. Because it looks like there's a lot of great information that's out there. Uh, sometimes it's just knowing where to find it and how to use it. Um, so appreciate that uh, short list. Should we take some a few more questions, Andrew? Or are we feeling ready for breakout? Maybe, yeah, one or two more questions. OK, sure. Um, so the, there was a question maybe a, as a merger between these two presentations, um, and this was directed originally, um, uh, the presentation um, from Brooke and from Sarah, um, but I think it connects with Michelle's work, and have there been any efforts to um, map the kind of the very small and the very large, um, uh, like the two of you were talking about, maybe thinking regionally or thinking about um, you know, na even nationally, so that it kind of moves from maybe the more abstract and the high level to the very tangible in a way that um, could be used by food hubs or by different businesses to to think about how they're interacting both locally, regionally, and nationally. So any other presenters, do you have any knowledge of efforts like that or how to connect the dots there? So we haven't really thought about that. Um, and honestly, I don't have much experience with mapping and you know food supply and kind of that piece. Um, but the idea of doing something regionally is really interesting, and I think something that could be very beneficial as well. But I, 
Yeah, I don't have too much information on that, but that's definitely something to kind of think about and keep, you know, have the wheels turning. Um, I do know that we didn't get to share, but we, our food and ag team created a um, New Hampshire farms product map. So mapping, they noticed they had a lot of meetings with um, local farmers and kind of they're changing the way they're approaching things. They're creating farm stands. They're going to food hubs, different, trying to get their products out to um, local residents. So, and I can share that in the chat too, but they created a farms product map too, to kind of keep the supply chain going in New Hampshire based on this COVID-19 pandemic and response to that. Um, but that's kind of all I have. Michelle, have you seen anything uh, along those lines as far as, um, you know, connecting things regionally or multi-state projects that are dealing with some of these national issues? And, and like, a, for instance, as I know that right now there's a lot of news around meat processing, um, especially in larger plants, and that's going to have a regional and national impact um, that could have some very real impacts on some of these very local efforts and access points. I was just reading a Bloomberg article this morning um, that talked about how um, in Europe um, meat concentration, a con you know, uh, is much lower than it is in the United States, um, uh, like a lot lower. And they think that's one of the reasons why meat packing plants in Europe are not having the same kind of COVID problems that we've got here because everybody, you know, the plants are super fast and super efficient. They're just packed full of people working, um, shoulder to shoulder here in the United States. And that's what's in part causing some of the problem. Um, as far as regional projects go, um, I know a little bit about the FSME project, but I, I'm sorry that I can't speak as intelligently about it as, as it deserves. It was a really wonderful project looking at regionalizing the Northeast um, um, food system. Uh, I think uh, Penn State was the lead um, institution on that. Maybe somebody else on the call or in the breakout room can talk about that. Definitely. Um, we are about to go into our breakout room, but I'm glad you said that, Michelle, because in the chat box, the brilliance and expertise of everyone that's tuned in is being shared. Um, there's a lot of great links, a lot of great suggestions. So, um, you know, definitely take a look at that um, and, and see if there's any crossover points there and good resources. Um, we are ready to launch the breakout room. So we're just gonna take, you know, 10, 15 minutes just to see what specific questions folks might have um, so that we can dig in and also hear your expertise if you have suggestions. So we'll go ahead and launch those breakout rooms. You'll find yourself redirected and then we'll um, come back in about 10 minutes or so. Um, but wanted to do some report out afterwards so everyone could benefit from the from all the conversations that were had and wanted to start um, with Pete I believe um, and Jane may be sharing a little bit from the, the conversation that y'all had to, to give the rest of us a taste of it. Yeah definitely uh, share a few uh, highlights and yeah Jane um, also from the Walls team can can add in if I missed anything. Uh, so we had a great conversation, a lot of great points from some of the, the uh, various perspectives and expertise. Uh, there was some points around this idea of standardizing some of the local efforts to map so that those that are working regionally and nationally could have a better or an easier time rolling information up and be able to have a more accurate picture of what's happening nationally. Um, so there was some a great suggestion there. Um, Michelle also kind of pointed out that the public data sets that used to be available and used to be collected either aren't collected anymore or now they are privatized and if you want to have access to data you have to pay for them and not everybody has uh, infra, uh, the resources to get behind that paywall to get the data and that excludes them from certain levels of decision making. There was also a um, question around how things are just changing with COVID and food planning and mapping that had been done previous to the pandemic has changed, systems have changed and will continue to change um, and how we can um, think about mapping resiliency in this time and how things respond to crisis um, and that there's opportunities to be able to see um, where some things that have always been problems in the food system for decades, if not longer, um, are being exposed and kind of very rapidly accelerated in terms of their problematic nature uh, and their impact on folks, especially farmers, especially food chain workers uh, and consumers as well. Um, and that there's some opportunities to think about resiliency mapping uh, and how that might uh, also be great opportunities to push for legislation and some changes that allow for concentration to happen um, and, allow, and therefore help us be more resilient to climate change, to future issues such as this um, 
this pandemic. Um, the last thing I'd add here, it was this idea around um, how we can use mapping to help farmers understand not only the profitability of different value or market channels that they might go into, whether it's direct or wholesale or otherwise, um, but also how do we help them understand and map the risk that's associated so um, to encourage diversification so that if one basket drops, not all the eggs are in it. Um, and how do we kind of help that pivot point for farms so that they aren't ultimately left um, holding the product, but without the contract or without the market. Um, uh, so I'll leave it there. Jane, were there any other points that you wanted to add in? I think, you know, that was great. Great. First time. I'd also welcome if there's any other kind of quick points that um, other folks heard that you wanted to quickly um, throw into the mix. Or Michelle, if there's something that rose out of that conversation from you. All right, if I, um, yeah, if nothing else to add, we can hear from the other group, the, the mapping group. It looks like I'm seeing in the chat box a lot of um, resource sharing. And so we'll capture those, we will capture those in the notes and share that after the call, just to, for as far as platforms and other maps. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll pull that together. Um, but Annalena or Ellie, would you like to kick off um, sharing from your group? Yeah, sure, I can kick us off. Um... Pete, sounds like you guys had a really robust conversation. So that sounds really interesting. Um, we kicked off our conversation with a question around how to lessen the burden for farmers around inputting their data into, into these maps. Um, and it really came out that you do a lot of layer, or folks had done, done a lot of layering and had like community outre outreach teams to compile all of that um, and then input it in layers. So partnering with Department of Education um, and different organizations in the area. It's not just totally relying on an extension service, um, but other places as well. Um, then we had folks share about the different maps that they're working on as well and how food policy councils have been pivotal in creating those maps and sharing the resources. Um, and it looks like from the chat box, lots of conversation around using ArcGIS as the format um, and platform to house that data. Ellie, you wanna share anything? Yeah, I think um, from the examples we heard, Annalena, you kind of hinted at this, but it seems like it's really critical to have that sort of central organization that's doing the information collection, but that you need a lot of partnerships and a lot of uh, other folks to help you keep that data relevant. And yeah, you mentioned, you know, uh, departments of health, Food Policy Council seem like a really important partner in these things. So maybe that institutional organization is the center. They're the ones that have the ArcGIS expertise maybe, but also really need to uh, tap into the other expertise and the wisdom in their communities to build something that's comprehensive. All right, thanks. Does anyone else from the, um, the mapping group want to share a takeaway from that or um, any ahas for you? Um, while you're thinking, I did just, there was some in the chat box, people asking about um, collecting lists of local resources and that's something we can do. I just put that link on the sign up sheet. There's also a tab for a list of maps. And so as we we're pulling this call together, we noticed there were so many different examples and ways of doing these. So um, we're happy to, to share that back out afterwards. So if you um, wanna do that now or even after the call, we'll, we'll include that um, in the follow-up notes. Well, thank you all for joining. Um, I think it's a big group and there's, we had two conversations, so we'll um, continue it online. So we will send out the recording and notes to everyone. Um, and just appreciate your time and coming and sharing all the resources that you've been working on. Um, really appreciate that. And we'll just do what we can to support um, y'all going forward. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I look forward to the comments. Thank you, Thank you guys. We'll get those over to you. Promise. Thanks, everybody. Thank Wallace you everybody. Team Rocks. <laughs>